And now, your selection. Meet the stars. It had taken Enron 16 years to go from about 10 billion of assets to 65 billion of assets. It took them 24 days to go bankrupt. What do you feel like, uh, through the course of all your investigations, what do you feel like was the most tragic part of this whole debacle? To see something that begins with, with such a grand promise end in such a terrible way, there's, there's, there's tragedy there. And the broken dreams of people's lives that go along with that, not just the retirees who lost all their money and the you know, employees of the company who had, had, had to start again, but people who really thought they were doing something at Enron and now have to look back on their years there and say, was, was that all just an illusion? The rules weren't quite clear. They could bury debt, they could bury losses. An industry that was very reliable for 100 years was all of a sudden turned into a casino. I mean, the largest tragedy is what happened to the employees um, and also the investors. And also there's a personal tragedy. There's a one, one Enron executive who committed suicide. Um, if there's a tragic figure in the film, I think it's really Jeff Skilling. Did you convert stock uh, worth $66 million? Uh, I don't know, but I, I don't know. Would that be surprising to you to learn that you did that? No, that would, uh, that would not be surprising. Jeff Skilling, toward the end of Enron's life, would say, we're, we're on the side of the angels. And he couldn't see that the, the, the picture he had in his mind of the company was so different than the actuality of what, of what the company was doing. Enron is a company that deals with everyone with absolute integrity. It's talking about my compensation, and if I step on somebody's throat on the way, that doubles it. Well, I'll stomp on the guy's throat. <laughs> Could you tell me how American mythology played into this whole scandal? I think myth is good within business culture because we all need something to believe in and you need to believe that you're doing something grander than just making money and that was at the heart of Enron people were very idealistic in some ways. They thought they were changing the world and that drove them to work 18, 20 hour days and fly around the world at a moment's, at a moment's drop. But it can become bad when you believe in it and don't see reality unfolding in front of you. I think Jeff Skilling had a desperate need to believe that Enron was a success. I think he identified with Enron, he proclaimed at one point, I am Enron. The other thing about people at Enron is a lot of them were former nerds, and including Jeff Skilling. He had been paunchy, he had big glasses, he losing his hair, and Jeff Skilling one day kind of woke up and decided to change himself. And he started working out, lost a lot of weight, but he really did remake himself through sheer will and force of personality. You know, there's some great things about American mythology, and one of them is this idea of reinvention. You can reinvent yourself, and you see these guys, these geeky nerds, who've tried to reinvent themselves as macho, um, you know, bikers. A core cadre of Enron guys used to go on these wild adventures. Andy Fasta would go, Ken Rice would go. The trips were legend. You know, we can sit and think about what strange insecurities they were trying to overcome, but it made them feel good as men. Fundamentally, they fooled themselves, I think, too. And that's what Enron is all about. I mean, they invented this company out of whole cloth, and, and what they pretended that it was was not at all what it really was. How exactly does Enron make its money? Accounting doesn't get that creative. We are the good guys. We are on the side of angels. It has evolved to the corporate crime of the century.